everyone. This is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com. Today we're going to be going over a famous game called the Evergreen Game. It was played between Anderson and Gene Dufresne. It was played in the 1800s, Anderson being probably the top player around the 1850s, and Gene Dufresne, a very talented player in his own right, actually a student of Anderson. So it's always interesting to see um, the student play the teacher. White's going to be played by Anderson, and Black's going to be played by Dufresne. Now this was a friendly, this was not a tournament by any means, uh, which I think actually added some flavor to it because both sides played an extremely, extremely fun game to watch. So definitely going to be entertaining watching these two powerhouses from a few hundred years ago actually play chess and play a beautiful game at that. So the game started out, Anderson opted for the Evans Gambit which is we kind of come through, knight f3, knight c6, bishop here to c4, and then when the bishop is met here on c5, white's going to actually give up material here on b4 and exchange for a lead in development. So when the bishop comes back here, the pawn's going to push forward to d4, and then after we take here, white's going to castle on the king side. Can't take right away with this pawn simply because the pawn is being pinned down to the king right here. Black has a few options. One of the more common moves would just be to actually take this pawn here on c3. Um, in this particular game, Black chose to play pawn to d3, pushing this pawn a little bit forward. White does have the option to go ahead and retake if he wants to. Instead, White decides to go ahead and play very aggressive, and he actually brings his queen over here to b3, which attacks this pawn here on b7, and if this bishop ever gets involved into the game we could see pawn to d6 then we could see the light square bishop involved would be attacking this pawn as well but very importantly it's putting two attackers against this very weakened square for black early on the f7 square very early on weak for black because the king is the only piece that defends this and so it becomes a huge target early on for white to attack so bring the queen here definitely an aggressive move here from white and now the queen's going to come to f6. This kind of blocks it off. It also gets a queen involved into the game. You usually don't see nowadays, uh, which is why sometimes I like to actually explore some older games because people were just relentless. They would bring their queens out early. They would do a lot of stuff that nowadays is kind of frowned upon, but it did make for some really entertaining chess. So bringing the queen out here to f6 to not only develop one of the major pieces in the game, but also again very important to protect the square here on f7. White's going to push forward with his pawn. Pawns are definitely meant to be pushed. Now there are two attackers on this. We have the knight here on c6, the queen here on f6. But remember if you know we would have the knight take and then the knight take, if the queen were to take here uh, then the pawn here on f7 would be vulnerable. So although there are two attackers and only one defenders, black still has to, to stay in check here um, no pun intended, to worry about this attack here on f7. Black now moves queen to g6, doing a couple things, still being active in the game, protecting this pawn on f7, and also protecting the pawn here on d3. Black might eventually just give this pawn back in material. Again, black is up in material right now because you know white played the Evans Gambit. But it does make it a little bit harder. White can't just immediately take this pawn back with his bishop. So again, it's kind of frustrating right now, but white does have some options. Decides to play rook over here to e1. Could later play rook here to e3. Put a double attacker on that pawn on d3. Just one of the options that he does have. Now, the knight comes over here to e7, which again is a very good move. He would like to play you know, knight here to f6. Really get involved into the center of the board because that pawn there on e5, that's kind of a pain. But this allows black to go ahead and castle on the king side, put another defender on this f7 square with the rook over here and on f8. So a lot of good things that black has going for him. Doesn't have to worry about too much. He does have some king safety right now, kind of with this block off. White decides to go and play bishop to a3, which right now is not doing too much. Mostly as we just talked about, this knight is now kind of blocking this off. Even with the exchange, you know, black should probably go ahead and castle on the king side. And then even if there was an exchange, this is going to be fine for black is, you know, it's kind of an open board right now. Give, taking one of the powerful bishops that white has off the board would be good. In the particular game, though, black chose to play pawn to b5. Kind of a questionable move, giving back some material. But the game that he gets 
isn't really that significant. So after the queen takes, the rook's going to swing over here to b8. So black gets a small tempo gain here, getting his rook involved, controlling this long file right here on the b file, and again forcing this queen to move. So the queen doesn't have too many options. The queen does decide to come back here to a4. And then we have the bishop swing back to, to b6. Now keep in mind, in this particular situation, black can no longer castle on the king side. If he does, then this knight here on c6 is actually now overloaded. So if the bishop takes here on e7, and then the knight takes, then the queen can now take this bishop on a5, which was a little bit different if we come back and look at the original position with the queen here on b3. Black really doesn't have to worry about that. He can go ahead and castle on the king side, and he's going to be completely safe. But after the you know the pawn comes down to b5, and after the exchange, the queen comes back here. Black can no longer castle, so he needs to figure out a way to either a have this bishop not under attack, or he also needs to find a way to not have this piece overloaded. If you're white, you always want to attack the overloaded piece or take one of the options away. So you would want to attack either this knight or this bishop because this knight here on c6 cannot defend both of them. So if you're just kind of looking at strategies of what both sides are looking to do or what sides are trying to prevent the other colors to do, that's kind of what both sides are looking at with this knight here on c6. Now we have the bishop coming back here to b6, which makes sense. We want to make sure this knight here on c6 is no longer overloaded. And then the knight's going to come here to d2. It's about time that white finishes his development, so both of his rooks are connected. Now he can get his rook over involved into the game on b1, try to counterattack and control the b file. Also has both of his rooks here, so we could also bring his rook over here to d1 if he wanted to control this semi-open file. Definitely gives white some options. He can also now bring his knight to e4, try to control the center of the board. He doesn't have the availability to bring his knight to c3, so really knight to d2 is his only option. Now black plays bishop here to b7 which in my opinion uh, is just a move that you can't make. It's not really doing anything for black. Black really has to castle on the king side. Again, he played bishop here to b6 to make sure that his pieces weren't overloaded so that he could castle, and he plays bishop here to b7. Not super important for his bishop to come here to b7. It's not doing too much in the game, but again, this particular game, that's what Gene decided to play. Now white's going to bring his knight to e4, which is an interesting move. Again, it develops one of his pieces to a central square, but it blocks off the queen from the pawn here on d3, which, again, black kind of wanted to do. Now black has a few options. One move I really like for black is the desperado move. If we look at it, white on his next move can take this pawn here on d3. And that's fine. The bishop here on c4 is no longer really a huge threat on this long diagonal so you know taking here on d3 isn't going to be too bad it also has a discovered attack on the queen so if the knight were to move the bishop would be attacking the bishop or the queen here on g6 so that would actually be completely fine for white a really good move that black has is desperado meaning that he knows this pawn's going to leave by the wayside it's gone has no chance at life to actually play something pawn there to d2 nice little move knowing that your pawn or your piece is going to go down in flames and forcing your opponent in a worse position or to take some additional material is always good so in this particular case white has to do something he's not going to play you know the rook over here to d1 that waste to move right there if he wants to take it, he's going to take it with one of his knights and that's going to again kind of lose a tempo in the game which is exactly what black wants so this would have been good in the actual game, black decided to play queen to f5, uh, which is a pretty poor move because after the bishop on d3, now queen on, f on f5 has to move because the threat of the knight coming here to f6, the knight coming here to d6, both of these are discovered attacks, checking the king here on e8, but then also opening up the door for the bishop to take the queen here on f5. So the queen's forced to move. The queen moves over here to h5. And then from here, white decided to play what I'm going to consider a pretty crazy move. And he played knight here to f6. Now, part of me feels like if this was an actual tournament, or if maybe he was playing Paul Morphy back in the day, you might not see a move like knight to f6. You could see 
knight to g3. Again, white has all the momentum. He's definitely leading in the game right now. All of his pieces are very active. Black really doesn't have a lot of his pieces aligned. He, de he hasn't castled, so he doesn't have a lot of kingside safety. His one rook that's controlling this file is blocked by his own pieces. His bishops really aren't, aren't doing too much. This bishop here on b6 is somewhat active, but his knights are both pretty passive. You know, knight here to g3, kind of opening up the door for the queen to move once again. He can now get his other dark square bishop involved into the game, putting a lot of pressure. He can swing his queen over. Definitely going to be good for white. Fortunately for us, since we are going back and looking at it, he played knight here to f6. And I think back in probably 1850, he, he had the choice. He can either take the safe route and play knight here to g3, or he could play knight here to f6. The worst that would happen is he would have you know, an equal position that he was maybe a little bit stronger than his opponent, and that he could probably win in the end game. But if his plan actually worked out, then 160 years later, maybe someone on YouTube would do some commentary on the game. That's at least what I think he was thinking about back in 1950. But alas, here we are. He plays knight here to f6. Pretty crazy move to go ahead and sacrifice after the pawn takes and the pawn recaptures. If we look at this position, things have definitely changed. We have a pawn here on f6, which is going to be a menace for black to deal with. But black can now, he could bring his rook over here to g8. He now controls this long semi file right here, semi-open file, which is going to be a pain for white because that's where white's king is. The queen can also come down to h3 after the rooks over here, putting a lot of pressure on white. White would be forced to you know, bring his bishop over here to f1 to protect that square, bringing a lot of the pieces that are active and making them less active. So again, both sides now have a lot of fighting chances. This is pretty close to equal as far as what's going to happen here. Black decided to go ahead and bring his rook over here to g8. Also, again, this knight here on e7 can't go anywhere. It's being pinned down by this rook on e1. If anyone was wondering why this rook just doesn't, or this knight doesn't move here on e7. And now the rook swings over here to d1, which, again, we're just kind of getting into these crazy moves because it makes a lot of sense to go ahead and take this pawn here on e7 or start to try to defend over here on the king side. And then black has two options. Probably the best move for black is to go ahead and play queen to h3. This forces white to go ahead and do something right away because the next move from black, if white ever blinks, is checkmate right here. This is really, really difficult for white to, to deal with. In the actual game, again, lucky for us, it's always good to look back. Black decided to play the queen over here to f3. And this actually opens up the door for white to go on a crazy attack, which is exactly what he does. Uh, this pawn here on d7 is no longer being protected by the queen over here on h3, which is very important because of the next line of attacks that Anderson employs on the game. So we have the rook taking here on e7 check and then we have the knight coming back here on e7 taking and this knight's no longer being pinned by the rook on e1 so we can now move and again this queen not being over here on h3 protecting this pawn on d7 is actually going to play a huge role in this next sequence because the next sequence is queen over here to d7 and this is probably the decoy of the century. If if you can ever employ a decoy like this and a sacrifice like this, it's just the greatest feeling ever. I'm sure Anderson at this particular case was just like, yep, someone on YouTube is going to be making a video about me in, a, in 160 years. I actually pulled it off. My opponent had no clue that this was going to happen. This is really, really, really awesome. So uh, after the king takes, then we have the bishop coming here to f5. A double check, so both the rook and the bishop are attacking. Double checks are always good because they force your opponent to move the king. There's no other way to stop it. The king has to move. Uh, the king now moves back to e8. Again, if there's other moves that he wanted to try, again, he's going to be checkmated earlier. Um, and so the king comes back here to e8. And then we have the bishop coming here to d7. And the king comes back over here to f8. Again, he could try other moves, but he's just going to die just as fast. Um, 
you know, if the king came over here to d8, then we're just going to see the bishop come here to, to e7. Again, all these moves could go other ways, but it's still going to be the same result. So the king came over here to f8, and then the bishop here on e7, checkmate. Phenomenal game uh, from Anderson. Really, really just crazy the fact that he thought about this even when he was sacrificing his knight here on f6. Um, also really glad that you know Gene decided to take here on f3 and not come down here on h3. But you know he probably just didn't see the fact that two moves after that the queen was going to have a decoy on here on d7. So again, this was the evergreen game. Really, really interesting to see you know some of the powerhouses back in the game completely just going at each other, sacrificing pieces left and right just for these small advantages. And then eventually with one of the, the greater lines that you'll see at the end of the game with some crazy sacrifices leading into a double check and then eventually a checkmate. So hopefully you guys enjoy this. I always want, like doing commentary on old games just because they are super, super exciting. So um, hopefully you enjoyed. Hopefully you maybe learned something, and I'll see you on the next video. Thanks for watching.